Welcome everyone to lecture seven of BIS 103. Today we want to follow up on our discussion on the TCA cycle from lecture six. And we want to look at how we can actually refill the TCA cycle if we are siphoning off some of its intermediates. And in addition, there are some separate videos on topics we want to cover today. We want to look at gluconeogenesis, so how we can biosynthesize um, glucose specifically, as well as a separate video on how we can form poly and disaccharides from glucose and other sugar monomers. So learning goal just for this section of the lecture and for this video is we want to be able to describe the anaplerotic reactions, so the reactions that refill metabolites into the TCA cycle. And as part of this, we'll have to look at one more cofactor and try and understand what this is, that's biotin, and watch out, there also is a short separate video on biotin. So let's jump in. Just sort of a recap of our discussion of the TCA cycle, right? Here again, is sort of the simplified version of the TCA cycle, right here in red. I've left out the structures, just left the intermediate names. But remember, right, we brought in acetyl-CoA from our PDH reaction coming out of the glycolytic pathway here. We are condensing it together with OAA, oxaloacetate, as the two substrates of the first reaction of the TCA cycle. We're building citrate. We're doing an isomerization here to isocitrate. That isomerization that was important for the next steps to the position-specific decarboxylations. Those are happening now. First decarboxylation here, right, to move to alpha-KG, alpha-ketoglutarate. Another decarboxylation to form succinyl-CoA. And then much of the remainder of the cycle, we had said what right, was for the purpose of regenerating OAA. That would allow us to continuously run the TCA cycle if we want to use it for the purpose of generating chemical energy. And then we had ended in lecture six on saying we can also use it not as a cycle, but for the biosynthesis of precursors and other important metabolites. But in this case, right, we are siphoning off, we're removing intermediates from the TCA cycle. And so some examples here are alpha-KG that can be used as a precursor for glutamate, and glutamate in turn can be used to produce a number of other amino acids. And similarly, OAA here can also be removed from the cycle to make aspartate, another amino acid. And from aspartate, again, you can produce a series of different amino acids, all critical for protein biosynthesis, as well as pyrimidine bases, which are important in nucleotide biosynthesis. But right, if you do this, keep in mind, if you remove one of these intermediates, you will disrupt the cycle, right? If you do so, you have to put the metabolites back in, right? If you're removing alpha-KG, for example, for synthesis of other compounds, right, this becomes a linear pathway now from OAA and acetyl-CoA to citrate, isocitrate, alpha-KG into glutamate. So we can obviously not do the recycling pathway steps back to OAA. What we say here is with needs, we need stoichiometric amounts of OAA to refill the cycle. So for every one molecule that we're taking out of the pathway, every one molecule of intermediate, we have to put one back in. And there are certain types of reactions that we can use to do so to make sure the TCA cycle can continue to function as a cycle even if we are removing some metabolites for other biosynthetic purposes. So how do we do this? How do we refill intermediates into the TCA cycle? There are two reactions, actually. The first one I show here is actually we can use pyruvate again. We can use pyruvate and directly convert it into OAA. So you may ask, what actually is the point of the whole TCA cycle if we can do it in one direction, right? But keep in mind, the TCA cycle allowed us these eight reactions to remove carbon dioxide, to oxidize acetyl-CoA, to generate three molecules of NADH and one molecule of FADH2 as our electron carriers, right? And regenerate OAA. So it has multiple purposes that allow us to make so much energy with it. 
that in this one single reaction you could not do. But you can use this direction from pyruvate to OAA to refill the cycle, to bring OAA back into the TCA cycle. You actually need a number of things to do so, right? And they're outlined here. The first thing you need here is ATP. We actually need to use hydrolysis of ATP to free up enough energy to bring about this reaction. Another thing we need is here bicarbonate. Bicarbonate actually is in your bloodstream. Where does this actually come from? It comes from carbon dioxide, right? And remember what some of our products were of the TCA cycle, right? Decarboxylation reactions. We are generating carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide will first go into the bloodstream. You will eventually breathe it out in part, but some of it actually can go back here and can be used and can be combined with water. This is typically non-enzymatic that just happens spontaneously in solution and you can generate bicarbonate. If you want to remember what bicarbonate is, all of the bakers among you, bicarbonate is nothing else than baking soda. So you are actually in this reaction making your own baking soda. So how do we utilize these things now? Right, we're bringing in pyruvate. And what we can do is actually we can carboxylate using this bicarbonate. Okay? The enzyme is called the pyruvate carboxylase. I will not ask you to know the exact reaction mechanism. What you should know though, is that it requires ATP and the energy out of ATP hydrolysis. It requires bicarbonate and it requires another cofactor here, biotin. Okay. We look at biotin in just a second. Before I go there, just to highlight that the pyruvate carboxylase actually was thought to be only present in the mitochondria of animals. Actually, there's more recent research that also shows that some microbes are actually also capable of catalyzing this reaction. They have a related enzyme to do so, right? just as an at the side note. But now we want to look at biotin. Biotin is actually a critical cofactor here that allows us to incorporate this bicarbonate coming from carbon dioxide into pyruvate to make OAA. So there's a new cofactor, biotin. And again, watch out, there's a separate video on biotin that you can also watch if you just want to sort of recap all your knowledge on cofactors, there are all these series of videos that focus on only those. So this is what biotin looks like. It's an enzyme bound cofactor. You do not need to recognize or, or draw and know the structure. I only want you to understand really what it does. It's vitamin B7. We cannot actually make it, but we don't need it to get through our diet because we are really lucky that our intestinal microbes actually supply us with biotin. What I really want you to remember though is what it does and what biotin actually is, it's a one carbon carrier. And in most cases, it carries carbon dioxide. What that means is that using ATP and the energy from it, we can bind carbon dioxide in this reaction here in form of bicarbonate to biotin and biotin then can then transfer it over to the substrate to generate a new molecule. And this is how we can incorporate carbon dioxide via biotin into pyruvate to make oxaloacetate OAA. All right, this was the first reaction. Now let's jump to the second one. This is another reaction. It's another carboxylase, but now it's not the pyruvate carboxylase, it's a PEP carboxylase or PCK, another enzyme name that you want to remember. Right? We actually don't have this. Animals don't have the PCK. Yeast, bacteria, and plants actually have it. This is a reaction that they use to replenish the TCA cycle. Okay. In this case, we don't come from pyruvate, we come from PEP. Right? Remember, PEP was the last intermediate of our glytolytic pathway before we made pyruvate. Right? It's a high energy compound, it's an enolic phosphate. Right here is your alkene, your hydroxy group, that's an enol. If it has a phosphate ester, it's an enolic phosphate. So it's a high energy compound. And because of that, the reaction is actually independent of ATP. Unlike our pyruvate carboxylase, we do not need ATP. We also do not need biotin here. So this guy, because we're coming, in part because we're coming from a high energy compound, can do it directly. Again, we're bringing in bicarbonate, carbon dioxide in the form of 
um, bicarbonate here, and we are essentially replacing the phosphate group here. So we're using the hydrolysis of the phosphoryl group and the energy of that to bring in the carbon dioxide group at the C2 here. Okay. And so this way we can make the same molecule, oxaloacetate, just by a different mechanism. So just to summarize, we have two reactions that are called anapleurotic reactions that we can use to refill the TCA cycle. There are a few more. These are the major ones. We mostly go through refilling the TCA cycle at the intermediate of OAA oxaloacetate. Right? So if you remember, right, when we came into the TCA cycle with acetyl-CoA and OAA, then going through citrate, isocitrate, if you, for example, want to remove alpha-KG for making amino acids and proteins, we have to refill the cycle. In most cases, we will actually do so at this stage here, bring in another molecule of OAA. And then there are these two different ways. One that we are capable of coming from pyruvate directly to OAA using the pyruvate carboxylase. This requires ATP and biotin to incorporate our carbon dioxide and plants, bacteria, other microbes, they can use this PEP carboxylase here to circumvent the need of ATP and biotin. And so here we're using this high energy compound PEP to bring in carbon dioxide through hydrolysis of the phosphoryl group of PEP, we can make OAA. And thereby we have our TCA cycle refilled. We can remove intermediates for biosynthetic purposes and still continue to run the cycle simultaneously for the generation of chemical energy.